stay close. So we both work at Intel. My name is Eric. I'm a network software engineer at Intel. I've worked at Intel for about six years. I've been a previous C driver developer for all of those years, so I've been doing this straight out of college. And I've actually been here a few times. This is my fifth time. I think I figured that out last night. And my co-presenter is? Uh, I'll try to talk pretty loud here. I'm Jake. I'm also a network software engineer at Intel. Uh, I've worked there for about seven years since I got hired, a couple internships before that. Uh, I have some Linux experience. I recently joined the FreeBSD driver team at Intel, and this is my first uh, BSD game. So I'm pretty excited to be able to talk. So we'll start this presentation by talking about how we got started with test-driven development. Um, is everybody in this room? I have to go back to the first slide and say this is the presentation. So it started off pretty simply. We first heard about it because we have multiple driver teams at Intel that work on our Ethernet devices, and one of the teams just said, hey, we're using this. And we were like, OK. But before that, we had also heard about it in other places. Like at Intel, we have this software professionals conference where people across the company come and give talks on software engineering practices. And one of the people gave a pretty convincing presentation. Um, and it's X, which is Explore. So it was actually not part of the conference. It was part of some other track, but it was really informative. Um, so for us, it sounded convincing because we have a new driver we need to develop, but it's more complex than all of the older hardware that we've developed for. So we needed something that would work better and would hopefully get us developing and getting our driver out faster. So TD looked like the thing that would fit for us. Um, we did have some things we introduced slowly over our previous drivers, but it didn't seem like enough. Like we had automated compile tests, so whenever we commit something, it compiles. So we spend less time trying to fix build failures, which is good. We can focus more on the logic errors and functionality issues. We have code review, but it can't catch every mistake. It relies on a human person looking through the code and trying to figure out if something goes wrong. And writing unit tests by themselves doesn't work because you can't just write tests for where you think bugs are going to be. So you can. It's just not enough overall. So it looks like it could maybe fix our problems. So we saw all these benefits. One was preventing code rot, which is an issue for our older drivers because we're afraid to change things because we have no way of testing if our changes work for these older parts. Like one specific example that maybe people in here might know about is EM and IGB, which use hardware that is super old, like might even be PCI for some of them, which is hardware we don't really have and we can't really test. So it's just there, and we have to hope nothing breaks when we change something. Another thing that's related to that is that it declares program expectations when you have tests. When you see a test, it's usually a good indicator that there's something that needs to work in a certain way. Um, so going back to the software PCX presentation, one of the presenters had a really good quote for this, for the test-driven development tests, is that unit testing is the safety net that lets you change code fearlessly. So it ensures that when you change code, the code still works afterwards because the tests can catch issues. Um, one of the big things that was important for us in terms of time was it catches bugs earlier, which reduces the time and cost to fix them. They can catch logic errors very quickly because as part of test-driven development, you're supposed to run the tests immediately after you write the code and tests and compile. So every time you compile, you're running the tests to make sure you catch anything as soon as it's added to the code. It also helps ensure the code matches the documented expectation because part of TDD, you're supposed to write the tests first. And usually you start building up documentation as the other hardware behaves, and then you write tests around that. So instead of getting lost in the code and then writing tests afterward, once you have the code done, you know how it's supposed to work at the beginning. One more note here. Uh, it helps prevent regressions because if a bug is introduced, usually a test that's previously written will catch it, so it'll fail, and then you have to go back and either change the test if the test is wrong and the bug is a result of you writing a wrong test or you have to write a new test if it's a bug that just wasn't covered before. 
it's supposed to offer better curl design, which is a little kind of vague for us. Like, it's the implication is that you'll have code that's easier to test, which means it's automatically better designed, which is good enough for us. And the last part was it was supposed to be fun because you write a test and then it fails, but then you go back and write the code and the code test passes. And then when you run your test, you get a little like zero failures. And you get a little rush. It makes you more excited to add more tests and add more code. So as part of the other team, when they talked to us, they pointed us to a book. And it was actually really helpful. Um, for us, we write our drivers in C because it's part of the kernel. So this book covered unit testing specifically for C, which was nice because it gave us a point to a framework to use. And since it was supposed to work with C, it was we just take it instead of having to apply something you know, like J unit or Pi unit. Um, it does mention drivers, but it's in the context of like embedded devices. So it's not super applicable to drivers, but it's it worked for us. So we pointed it out here because it was actually really useful. Um, I think one quote that was really interesting from the book is, why do we need TDD? We need TDD because we're human and we make mistakes. Computer programming is a very complex activity. Among other reasons, TDD is needed to systematically get our code working as intended and to produce the automated test cases that keep the code working, which we had a problem with in the past. And so we did know about this before this project. So one question is, why didn't we do this earlier? when we knew about it, we might have just start doing it when we had the project. And one is that it requires discipline and we have a lot of old code. So an issue with adding tests for old code is that it wasn't written to be tested. It's just there and you kind of have to figure out what can be tested with the time you've got, which is difficult. But if you start with new code, you can immediately start with tests and then write new code. And then it ends up being tested in the end, which is easier. We also need to change our cultural mindset because usually when we have to implement a feature, we like implement the feature and then we like send it to Garrett and it gets code reviewed and then it gets compiled and sent to validation. And like it takes too long to discover a bug that way. So we want to be able to discover bugs like when the compiler process happens. And so we need to tell, like change the mindset so that our code isn't done until that test written for it, not when validation looks at it and says it works. Um, and then finally, we did need to have a framework, which took a lot of work to do, so it was a valid concern. But it's hard to write tests when you don't have a framework, so it's just we have to get past that like hill of having a framework to test things, which was hard to do with old projects because they just keep on, we had new features to add and new ones to fix, and it just couldn't fit time into it, our schedule for that. So we pulled this diagram from the book because it's a nice visual explanation of the amount of time TDD can save. So it starts with this traditional like, programming model, which they call bug layer programming, which kind of it's a way of programming. Uh, so here, bugs are discovered late because we introduced a new bug in the code. And then bugs are typically discovered by either our validation people or hopefully not, but this happens to user. And it takes time to discover the bug, or between discovering the bug and causing the bug. Because since it's usually been a while, we don't have any of the context information. So we have to infer what's wrong by looking at logs or bug reports. And it's, it takes a while to root cause the issue. And then to fix it, one issue is that new features could be written over like expecting the behavior of the bug. So then if we fix the bug, we may have to go back and also fix the new features that depend on the behavior of the bug. So fixes tend to be more complicated. So TDD is supposed to shrink the time for all of that. When we introduce a new bug, it theoretically could be caught by the time we run the test, which should happen immediately after we write and compile the code with the bug in it. So the time to discover the bug is shorter. Running <coughs> the bug is easier, too, because it should have should be discovered very quickly after you write the code, which means you still have like the context information in your brain and like what the objective of the code is. And hopefully it's also something you wrote too, so you have a more intimate understanding instead of trying to do code archaeology to figure out what somebody else is thinking when they wrote the code and introduced the bug. And then the time to fix, it's not necessarily faster, but 
like my, mentioned in the previous slide, there's no time for something built or depend on the behavior of the bug. So hopefully the bug is relatively simple and doesn't cause any, for fixing the bug doesn't cause any side effects you have to worry about because it's still new. <coughs> and another way to think about the time is that it also saves money, which is something our manager wanted us to consider, but uh, like we spend less time debugging, so hopefully we spend more time designing and implementing new features and all the other things that are important to our job. And also, it's fun. I don't like debugging that much. <laughs> so, test-driven development. We figured it wouldn't solve everything, and it doesn't, so we had these concerns that we're willing to work with that the tests take time to develop. Part of it is thinking what you should be testing, but another part of it is that tests can be longer than the code you actually write. Like when we were thrown around, or two or three times more code than the actual feature that you're testing. So it's just slower for developers because you have to write the tests and the code instead of just hoping that you run a quick test and hope validation doesn't find any bugs. Unit tests can cover everything. Cover part of this. You're writing the tests before you write the code, and you may not have a complete understanding of how things are supposed to work. So if you test what you can, and then just like reiterate when somebody finds a bug. And you just can't anticipate every bug. Just like that, hardware and firmware. We work on device drivers, and our devices, our new devices use firmware. So that's a new element of the device that we have to worry about, because something could be broken in firmware or in hardware. And we don't know how they work, because I think even the people who design them sometimes don't know what the expected behavior is. So we have to just deal with that. We can't plan for that. We just get, uh, this needs to behave this way now, and we need to change the code for that. But test-driven development is supposed to help. I think the first point, one of the slides was, it prevents code rot. So we can actually go in and change the behavior of our tests and code without worrying about something else breaking, because tests are supposed to catch the other things that break. So. The idea is, I kind of alluded a little bit to this in my previous slides, but you first start by writing a little bit of a test. Like, an example I give is that like a compile error is, counts as like a test failure. So when you write a test, you first try to think of like what the API will look like when you write a test that kind of looks like that API, and then the compile should fail, so you go back to the code, and then you actually like put some of the code you're there to make the compile. And then that cycle is done. So you go back, you add a little bit more to your test, and make it actually test functionality actually implement that function in the code, compile, and go back. One slightly weird refactor that we haven't spent as much time thinking about, but it's important because when you add a new change, you're supposed to refactor to make the new change easy. So um, so yeah, we don't strictly follow this here at right now because it's hard and we're still working on doing this. We've only been doing this for a few months to a year-ish, and so we're still working through our anxieties and getting over new ways of doing things, but we do enforce that at least new code has to have a test by the time it's committed, so we use Garrett to do code reviews, so there's at least like a human element of looking at the code submitted and making sure it has a test, and Garrett as well it will automatically run the compile and the tests. So it'll only get a verified plus one if you're familiar with Garrett. That means it's allowed to be like submitted and it's functional. So let's only the test pass. So at the very least, if somebody else sees your code, it has to have a test with it and it has to pass the tests. And then you want to do this. Uh, I guess I can do this over here. Switching links. All right, uh, I think you guys can hear me. Um, so one of the problems when you're writing a test is that you want tests, we, we kind of use the term good tests and all that. Some of the things that like we consider to be a good test is that it clearly defines, like if you, if you have a function that's supposed to do something, it needs to clearly define 
what you expect that function to do given the inputs or what you expect the behavior to be. And the best tests are independent of the internal implementation. You might think of something like you have an algorithm that's supposed to find an answer to a problem and you start by using a linked list and then you've decided that a tree is better. You don't want your test case dependent on the linked list. You want the test case independent so that when you refactor the code, the test doesn't break. Because that's a really good sign if you've written good tests and then you refactor all the code and all the tests pass, then you can be pretty sure that your change didn't change the effective behavior of the program. Uh, that's something that can be pretty tricky to do, especially in our case, uh, because we have, we're writing kernel driver code and our tests aren't running in the kernel space, so we kind of fake the implementation of the kernel. But a lot of that involves doing things like saying, oh, our attach function needs to call this kernel function. And then we don't really implement that function, but that means every kernel function you add to attach now changes the test and the test will fail because it's expecting functions and it doesn't get them or it's expecting only some functions and it gets others. So that's a little bit of a problem we've had. Um, but in our case, that's kind of good because calling a new kernel function really is a change in the behavior of your driver, so it makes some, some sense. But it can be problematic because if you if you have to change the tests every time you change the code, then you're less likely to change the code. And part of TDD is supposed to put you in a mindset where changing the code isn't a problem and refactoring isn't something you should be afraid of. Uh, so I'm going to talk also a little bit about the implementation that we did and the framework that we kind of developed on top of CPPU tests. Uh, so CPPU test is a C++ testing framework. Uh, it is available in ports for BSD, the latest available version, 3.8. There's been several changes to the master branch since, uh, since it's been released last, and we've actually made some fixes. Uh, specifically, we run our tests on both 32-bit and 64-bit user space, and there's several bugs that cropped up due to 64-bit types not being treated well in 32-bit platforms because they're long longs, and CPPU tests didn't support that. We did fix that, but there hasn't yet been a release. It's been about half a year. Um, part of CPPU test is this thing called CPPU mock, which is a layer that makes it easier to fake functions. And so instead of actually implementing a function call, you can replace it with a function that says mock expect, you know, mock actual call function name with these parameters. And that helps avoid having to take the entire kernel and run it in user space or something along those lines. Um, so, yeah, if you have driver code in the past, I was like, well, hey, it's driver code. You can't really write unit tests. It's really hard to do. There's no frameworks. And so it was really easy to dismiss and say, that's not worth the time. And because drivers rely on a ton of kernel functionality, you're, you're loading kernel headers and you're calling functions. You know, you're interacting, in our case, with iflib or with the ifnet structures. And we really don't want to run the unit tests inside the kernel. Part of what we want these tests is to be something that you compile your code, you run tests, you get back a result. And that takes minutes, you know, it, or, or less. And trying to do something inside the kernel is a much more complicated work. Uh, so we wanted to avoid that. Uh, so what we opted for was a route where we take our driver source files and we link them into test files. And the test files include fake kernel headers. So we are including, you know, sysmbuff or something like that. But it's not really the real header, it's a fake implementation so that our driver can compile and make things happy. There's some downsides to this because now we're not necessarily running the exact code that is going to run in the driver, but we felt that that was a lot better than not having any sort of test. Um, and so like we said before, some of these things, they don't cover every functionality because it's not an end-to-end -end test when you've loaded a kernel and you've run the driver in the real kernel. Um, but they're kind of a first layer on that. And when you have kernel headers, like we, we include tons of functions. We include different subsystems. We've got iflib, you've got the net headers, you've got a lot of different functionality. And uh, one of the other team that, that showed us this, they were doing a thing where they would take a header, they would just put it somewhere, and they would go, oh, I need the lock functions, and I need the Linux kernels list implementation. I need some of these things. And they would they just piecemeal enter bits in, and they kind of just left their header alone. Um, and so you get in this place where you've got these weird amalgam of kernel headers, and it doesn't really make sense where each piece came from, or how accurate it is, or if it's up to date with whatever's changed in the new APIs. Um, so 
Another problem is that CPPU test runs in C++. Um, there is a C framework, but we didn't like it. And it's pretty, I, I looked into it a little bit, and it was pretty difficult to, to use. It was more difficult than C++. So we opted to run the test in C++, even though our driver code is in C. But if you include a kernel header, you know, there's the kernel headers that use new and class and other C++ defined keywords. So those have to be changed if you want to include those headers. Additionally, uh, we want to keep up to date with what's in head with our test code. And that means headers are changing potentially daily by, by other places. Not every header we depend on changes that much, but we didn't want to get in a case where a year from now we're looking at FreeBSC 13 and we want to update all our headers and it's a huge nightmare to get everything up to date because all of the signatures changed, everything broke. Um, so we wanted a way to keep our header information in sync with what's actually upstream. Um, and part of that was defining some rules about what we do with kernel headers. So we opted to create a process where you take the FreeBSD kernel header and you put it in the TDE code, and then if you need to make any modifications, you have to wrap them in a special a C preprocessor flag. Uh, we use no TDD test framework, and basically you take any code that doesn't work, like changes to names, you wrap that in the ifdef, and then you put a comment that explains what you had to change and why, and then you change the code. So like we rename function variables from class to some other variable name so it doesn't conflict with C++. Um, this makes it easy to use tools to compare what you have locally with what's upstream, because we can use unifdef. It's a C tool for stripping out C preprocessor flags and showing you the, the code without the, the flags in there. And so then we can take the stripped version that removes the TDD test code and then we can compare it with what's upstream. And if it's not exact, then we know something upstream changed and we need to pull it in. Uh, so that is how we guarantee that, oh, somebody refactored if lib header and added new things to their structure. We can grab that into our test code pretty easily. We also, after having some of this in place, things were changing so rapidly that I decided it was too much work to keep doing that manually and created a process where that's actually mostly automated by having a job that runs every night and compares the headers and it goes, oh, this is what changed and I'm going to make that a patch. I'm going to apply that with the patch tool, put that in the kernel header, and then if it works, I'm going to submit it to review and you can, you can approve it and then submit the code that way. So most of this process, we, we automate to avoid having to manually continue to look into that. And in some cases, headers change on sections that we have wrapped with the if def so the patch doesn't apply cleanly in which case we get notified and someone has to manually approve. That doesn't happen very often. We only have maybe a dozen cases in the last year where, where I've had to go in and help resolve that process. Um, one of the things we created as part of this is that we have a, a JSON file that declares all of the headers we've copied. You can kind of see here, uh, as an example, we have a bunch of different types. We have generated headers, which are uh, one of the things we had to do uh, is because kernel headers are often shared with user space, so they have if def kernel in them, and we want our test code to function like it's in the kernel. Um, so we, we actually use on if def when we're generating, and we strip out kernel and a couple other uh, things that are related to like C standards and things that we knew we would have available um, when we're in the kernel. Uh, we also have some files that are generated when you compile a module, the object interface files from K objects. Uh, so we originally have a mode where you define a file as a K object file, and then we would pre-generate it using the, the make script to generate those files. Um, and there's a couple other types of files. We have other is some weird cases where we weren't able to generate because they were machine specific. Um, and so we didn't quite know how to fill those in. And the weirdest one is uni standard. I don't remember the exact details of what broke, but if you include the file, it breaks the C++ test framework that we're using because it starts conflicting definitions. And, and eventually we found out that if we just left the file empty, then the kernel sys uni standard include would get be happy and would include anything, but then all of the bits would work. Uh, so that's kind of a weird case where uh, there are some problems because we are including kernel headers, but our C++ framework is also including user space headers, and we have to deal with some of those problems. Um, a part of our automation for this is a Python script. Um, you can see here, this is 
kind of example, one of the features of this script is it helps generate the files for us and it helps compare files. So we can actually take a, a TDD test file we've created and we can show, well, what did I have to change? Uh, so we can have it basically take the file, strip out the TDD test framework code and then compare it with the unstripped file and give you a diff that says, oh, you changed this part that was in the kernel to be this change. And one of the things we do that's shown in this example uh, we take the PCI interface functions that wrap to the K object functions, and we don't really want to have our test uh, framework have to load up and, and initialize all the K objects. So we replace the header code to use the C++ mock actual call infrastructure. Uh, and this can be really helpful because it makes it easy to see when you have a file, you can very quickly get a diff format that just shows you, oh, this is what I had to change to make this file work. Um, we also use this tool as part of our verification because it runs every commit uh, to, the, to the framework that we have and compares with the latest upstream and then we'll tell you when things don't match. Uh, and you can also use it in that, in that way. So this is helpful to analyze what did we do, what did we change, and have you kept every file that you've included documented in the includes JSON file and documented in a readme that explains for each file what we were doing. Um, so part of the way we do this, because we have C code and we have our driver source files, you know, main and lib and, and txrx.c and the different bits of the driver, um, we opted to just directly include those files in test files. So we have a test folder and we might have a test main.cpp and at the top of the file it just does, you know, include main.c um, directly in. There's a couple of advantages to this. Uh, one, it makes it easy to keep your driver code in C and to keep your test code in C++. And it gives you access to static symbols. If you've got a C file and you have a bunch of functions in it, you might want to unit test some of the static functions. But if you just compile and link the C code as an object, you can't access the static symbols that are in the object file. Additionally, because each uh, C++ test file gets compiled to a different object, you can include your, your source file in one and then in that main test file, you can have mock implementations for the rest of your code. Uh, for example, we have a bunch of code that we work with many driver teams. We have shared code that we, we share with, with Linux and some other operating systems. And so that way we can just mock the shared code and our tests can focus on the core code that we wrote rather than trying to focus on a lot of the code that we didn't write and trying to add tests for code that, that hopefully works. There's, there is, uh, because this, the Linux team also helped we have some test infrastructure for that shared code, but we basically keep that independent from the core driver code. Uh, the other thing that we do, it's a little interesting, is we use the C++ namespaces. So when you take uh, files, we're gonna wrap all of our include files that we include the mocks and our core driver files in a namespace. So each test file has its own namespace, like the main namespace or the lib file has the lib namespace. Uh, one advantage of this is that you can re-include the same driver code in another test file, and even the non-static things won't conflict because the C++ name mangling will treat them as different objects. Um, as an example, the top of our main test file might look like this. Not every include is specified here, but you include some mock files that implement kernel or library functions, and then we include the main.c, and we say we're using the test main namespace. From this point on, you can write functions, you can write test functions that show uh, what each function is supposed to do. Uh, we have one more piece of our implementation that is a bit trickier. Uh, sometimes you're writing a test function and it might be something like, we, we have a test function for sys controls that sets up a bunch of sys controls and it goes out to four or five other functions that do different categories of sys controls. And we want our tests for the sys main function to be independent of changes to the other functions. Uh, so what we end up doing is runtime patching the function to go to a different function. Uh, this uses uh, something called libdetour, which is something that the Linux team that introduced us to this wrote. Uh, and essentially what it does is it, it non-portably saves 16 bytes of the function and then overwrites them with a jump and then a return. So it'll jump to the mock function and then jump back when it's done. Uh, it's definitely tricky, uh, but what it lets us do in our test code is say, is something much similar to what you would get in like a Java framework where you can go, hey, I want this function to be mocked as this other function that does something else. Uh, 
uh, that can help make certain kinds of tests easier so that if you change the implementation of a, of a static function, then the function that's calling it doesn't have its test break, which is a pretty big deal if you're refactoring code. And then ideally, your internal function has its own test cases so that they get covered as well. Uh, I wanted to show an example uh, of one of the cases. This is a little bit contrived of an example, but we have, I want to go over, uh, yeah. uh, I wrote it as a little bit of a tree that we can follow. Uh, so I'm going to basically go through the steps that you would do. Uh, and then, so here, yeah. oh, how do I get it to display the screen? There we go. So um, we have a pretty, pretty complicated hardware limitation in some of our new hardware with TSO packets, where when you're sending a TSO, the hardware is limited to eight segments at a time for that TSO. So if, if the stack has gotten lots of different little segments and tries to put them together into one TSO, but we can't send it because it'll cause the part to hang or, or, or in, it'll cause the part to issue a malicious event saying you tried to do something that would hang the part. Um, yeah, and so TSO, if you don't know what that is, it's a transmit segmentation offload for TCP. So what it lets the stack do is say, I want to you to send all of this data, a whole bunch of data, way more than what you would send in an Ethernet frame. Like, so instead of 1,500 byte chunks, you get 64K or something like that. And so the idea is that then the hardware is capable of just taking all that data and figuring out how to segment it for you and put it into packets that sit on the wire. But our hardware has a pretty weird limitation around this that lots of other hardware doesn't. So we had to implement a check that goes, how do I make sure that I'm not sending a TSO that I can't send? Um, and to do that, we wrote this check. And what I'm going to go through is an initial check and then I'm going to show some tests that we add, and then show that they break, and then show how we can fix the code. Uh, so here, uh, uh, it's a little bit complicated, but basically, we're trying to see, with the packet info we get, we're checking how many segments we got, and if it's within the segment limit. If it's not, then what we have to do is check every eight segments and make sure that they fit within the sizes that, are, that we have available. Uh, so we have this loop. And the idea is this function, given a set of packets, is going to tell me, yes, it passes, or no, it doesn't. Uh, and so we have some test coding here. The test code isn't there. If we go forward, uh, here. So now we've added some test code here. I'm going to look at it directly. Uh, yeah, if you're curious, we use get internally and install. Yeah. So, what we've done now is we have our test file, and now we include our mock functions for the, for the malloc, uh, sbuf, and kernel. We have a test group that defines uh, setup and teardown. So often you'll have, oh, I want to test like a driver function somewhere in the middle of TXRX, and there's a lot of state that the driver has that needs to be there. So we have test groups that allow us to encapsulate that shared state so that when they start the test, they'll create a whole bunch of stuff, mock some things up, and have you know, a PDF structure and have TXQs and things that are there for the test case. Uh, that's important so that your functions get all of the global state that they expect, which is something that's a little challenging to do in comparison to single threaded user space applications. Uh, but in this particular example, there really isn't that much shared state. So what we have uh, is we create a shared state for the TSO, which sets up a packet header that's basically a structure that des describes what the packet info looks like, how it's segmented. And then we have we create a function that lets add a packet segment. So we create this, and this is a simple test case, and it's a little bit confusing because we we know we know the header size is always 64, 64 bytes or something. 66 bytes. And so we, we can add the different segments here, and then we've said you know, we split the header over two chunks, and then we put the first part in the data, and we add all these segments. And here, this is a function, this is a test case, so if I can run this, 
so I'm in the test folder, and then we have a make file that just runs the test. So this compiles the test code, and it creates an object. This particular example doesn't have it all set up to run right away, but we have a shell script that runs the test. And you can see, OK, one test ran. There were eight checks in it. The test passed. So this is good. But if we add more test cases for this function as we are looking into what it does, in this particular case, what happened? We had this function, and then it got out into the wild to a user, and they had some weird setup, and they came back saying, oh, my part's not working. So they were able to tell us what the packet looked like. And so we then can come back, and now that we know, in this case, we had a regression to a user, but now they've told us what the problem is, we can add new tests. And so we add more test cases that add more segments in a different layout. These particular ones, in this case, came from real examples that the user who found the bug showed us. And so we can add, like this test case here, uh, we're adding a bad packet because one of the limitations is that the headers have to be in three segments. And in this case, the header data is split in four segments, so it's not possible for us to transmit it. But if we run the test and make this an example, now, we run the test, and it pops out and says that we have a failure. We look here, and it says line 183, uh, and it failed in this test. So if we go to line 183, we can see that this particular test documents that it should fail, so it should, the function should return 1 in this case to indicate a failure. But it actually didn't. The function that we have now doesn't treat this packet as bad. And one of the things we can do I don't think I set this up already. Uh, we can actually GDB the tests. Uh, I don't remember. I'll just write that. So if we, if we run this now, this is actually going to be GDB. And we can run the tests. And it just crashes here. But if we know that what we want to break on, like, uh, sparse here, and if we run, now, in this case, we don't know what, what function we're in, but uh, let me actually open and figure this out. Because what we want to be able to do with GDB uh, is figure out the test that's failing, which we know um, is line, it's in the test code, and it's in the sky. And we know that line 183 failed, so we know that this particular function here, uh, we're going to run this again because we know I put the wrong breakpoint. <laughs> but I might break at line uh, test example uh, here, and I might say break here at 158. And then if I run, we can see that now we're going to add the packet segment and this test code. So we, we don't care about that part. But we can get down to here where I ran I ran. <laughs> if we run again, though, and we actually will break on the right line because that would help us. Uh, break at 182. We can run continue, and if we step into this function now, this this is something you can do when you don't know how your code is functioning. You can see that like this code now we're actually stepping through this code. This is something that's very helpful because. Setting up a kernel debugger can be pretty challenging, so having the ability to execute your driver code in a debuggable situation, it's obviously not perfect because you're not running the real driver code, but in most cases, you're going to get sufficient examples. Um, so here, we can go over the deal, and we can see why the function it exits. Um, I don't remember <laughs> the exact specifics in this case, uh, but what we do have is, in this case, we know the fix, and we can build it oh. again. And then if we make, and then if we run the test now, now we show this works because we've re-implemented the function here, and we've changed how it works to cover those corner cases that weren't tested before. Um, and now all of the tests that we had passed and now we know that if we ever need to make changes to this function, we have good examples 
for what needs to work and what needs to not work. Uh, so that's kind of the basics of what we did. We created a framework that made it much easier to write tests for driver code. Um, the idea that we have is that we take our kernel headers and we keep them in a comma repo with the mocks for the kernel functions. Um, we want to open source that framework to make it easy for other people to use. We're currently in the process of working with Intel Legal and, and the open source group there to get approval for that. So it's not currently online or available yet. We're hoping to have that done soon. Um, but the idea is that we created this framework that keeps the headers up to date and has a bunch of the mocks already implemented for our drivers. We even have another team uh, working on another driver that took our framework and started using it right away. So they were able to be productive on tests significantly faster than we were initially. So the goal is to be able to keep reusing this test framework for drivers and potentially go back to other drivers and add tests as we find issues. Um, there's, because there's so much old driver code, it's challenging to get by off to spend tons and tons of time writing tests for it. But the hope is that if we use the framework, every time we make a change or every time that we fix a bug, we can add a test case so that we can at least begin having the test coverage. That's really about it. We have some backup on slides, but mostly it's uh, if people have detailed questions. Um, so if somebody has questions, feel free to ask. Yeah. yeah. So uh, I'm thinking when you're, you're showing the example of the Netflix yeah. driver, uh, so my experience with drivers like that is well, sometimes you run into problems like barriers or cache related things. Yeah. About DMA related. Uh, so that's, that's something that's a little bit out of scope for this right now. It's something that we, we do know, uh, like we have some things where if we look at like, uh, uh, that's in the legacy mining. Uh, we, we have some cases where like we have bus DMA things and we have code because we knew there was a bar barrier. We have tests like this that says, I expect you to have called bus DMA and sync. That doesn't really help in the case where you didn't know to do that. And that's something that we don't have a solution for yet because one of the things that the test codes kind of rely on is that there's nothing in parallel. One of the reasons for that is that there's global memory shared state and the way the CPPU test works is it loads your object and all the tests are there. So if you start running them in parallel, anything that depends on that global state is going to conflict in ways that are challenging to solve. Um, that's definitely something that finding a way to solve that would be really helpful, uh, but it's not something that we quite had. A lot of what we're trying to do with this uh, is help eliminate the bugs that are easy to fix with this, and then hopefully our debugging time is spent on solving more complicated bugs like that instead of saying, oh, well, I've got that complicated bug, but I spent all my time fixing these other bugs that were simpler. So yes, it is single-threaded. Um, that's something that I don't know how we would solve with this particular framework. Uh, yeah. Is it right that you don't run on the real hardware? It's a simulated. Hardware. Right. So we have like instead of actually running uh, like our real driver, we have we we mock all of the functions that would end up accessing the hardware. Or like we have register read functions, and so those get mocked. So you your driver, the, the test code says, I want to read 32 this address, and then we would say, Well, okay, you did, and it returned to this value. What do you do? So it's more of a way to outline this function. If it read this value from the register, what should it do in that case? Um, so yeah, it doesn't cover real hardware. We do have some programs uh, people are trying to do where they simulate the hardware, but that was a little bit out of scope for what we have in this. And this is like complementary to that. Yeah, the idea is that this is like the first layer, and it's more about declaring, hey, I wrote this function, and I think it should behave this way if it were given these inputs. And then you verify that your function did, give, did do that with those inputs. Because if anybody's written code, they know that you might have thought you wrote one thing, but it didn't work that way, and tests are a great way to cover that. Um, in terms of the real hardware or real kernel functions, this doesn't really cover that, so it's much more about the logic that you expect from the program. That's good for catching the error. Yeah, the other thing it's really great for is you have a big attach routine that your driver goes through. 
and hey, it failed in the middle. Well, now it needs to clean up everything that it did when it failed so we can write test code uh, like that. So we have like, uh, we have like an attach function. And so we have, we have an attach function and then we have versions of the attach function for every like, way that the attach function could fail. So like, if it allocates memory, then we have a function that goes, oh, you allocated memory here, and now if that doesn't work, then you're supposed to exit cleanly, and you're supposed to clean up everything you do. Um, one of the things we don't yet do that I'm looking into, C++ uTest comes with a allocator that replaces the default allocator and tracks like, oh, you allocated, you forgot to deallocate this memory. So we'd like to be able to switch to that so that we get places where even if we didn't remember to check, we can go, oh, when we exited this test case, it didn't deallocate all the memory that it did. Uh, but that's, that's one of the things we found it really helpful for is to help prevent the case where you just forgot to deallocate a chunk of memory or you forgot to like, shut down a kernel descriptor and so on. Yeah. Yes? I don't know quite how to ask it, but yeah. how do you how much of the kernel did you have to mock? I mean, so was it as big in scope as the test you were writing? Is it uh, surprisingly a small amount? So we have, uh, I had an example where we have several headers. Uh, so in our common, we have uh, like mock source here. And like the biggest thing we do uh, is we have a mock kernel. It's like every kernel function that we call. And like this is, let's see how many lines it is. Uh, so like this is maybe 1,500 lines of mock code there. We also have all of the headers uh, here. Uh, let's see if this works. So we have a bunch of headers we copied. And originally, we were doing this thing where we'd, we'd copy the header at some point in time, and then we'd hack it till it worked, and then it would just be there. Um, but now, what we actually do for almost every header is if we, need, if we suddenly need to include a new header, we just generate it with the unfdef command and put it in place, and that takes not very long to do. And then, because of our automated process, changes to that are fast. And in most cases, we don't have to even modify the header after we generate it. There's only a few cases where we had to do that. Um, so, Initially, there was quite a bit of work getting things set up, um, but now that we have it in place, it's usually we need to add a mock function. So anytime we get a new feature of the driver that depends on a new kernel infrastructure, we need to figure out how to mock those calls. But because of that, most common way to do that uh, is with mock functions. So that's very simple. Uh, so here, um, like we have, let's find a simple example. So we have some verified functions, but like if init name, it's a function we have to call in some cases, and it takes some parameters. All we do is we say mock actual call func, which is something I recently learned we can do to avoid having to duplicate that. Uh, and then you just specify the parameters, and then if your function, if your current, if your driver calls if init name, the actual call sets up C++ you test to say, oh, you called this function. And by default, every function that you call with actual call like this sets up in a chain, and if that function doesn't have an, ex if that test case doesn't say I expected this call, then the test fails. And that way we know that for every test for a function that calls I in a name, you have to declare that you expected it to be called. Um, so this is the case where uh, that can be pretty brittle. So you'll see some cases in here like if get dry flags. We don't use a mock for that. We just return the if flags directly because it's simple to implement, and it made it go. One of the problems with mocks is like I said, every time you add a new mock function, every test that calls that function has to be changed. And every time you delete that function from your driver, it has to change, which can create brittle tests. So we try to limit it to stuff that, that either we can't implement because it would require calling real kernel functionality we don't have, or for things that we know are expected behavior. Like if you're going to allocate your IFNet structure, you know that's expected, and you don't want that happening somewhere where you didn't expect it. Um, and so that's what this lets us do. There's, so like, I think there was maybe 20,000 lines of header code, but almost all of that was directly copied. And then there's a couple thousand lines of other mock code. And the nice thing is that we can take this common framework, put it in another driver, and hopefully not have to do as much work the next time. Yep. Any other questions? How much effort does it do 
your most up to date. Um, so once we have the automated case, uh, what happens is somebody might change, like if somebody came along and changed IF init name to have a new parameter, for example, then the header would get updated automatically unless we had teeny specific changes around that code that it conflicts with. And then that patch would get submitted to review and it would run its compile test, it would fail because the parameters don't match. So then we'd have to spend a few minutes fixing it. Uh, I would say that doesn't happen too often. Um, we usually have to spend, I would say maybe once or twice a month, we have something like that we have to fix. And then new features require more work because like uh, if you're working on a new part of the infrastructure, like we don't have task queue code yet for some of our stuff, we want to add task queues, that would take a lot more work to implement. It would probably take, take you know, several days or more of work to get it working in place and have everything work. Uh, but the, the goal is that in general, once we have it in place, we keep it and it's pretty easy to check, keep it up to date because mock functions, somebody adds the parameter, like if they added a parameter here, and you know, all I'd have to do is go down here and put the code in. And of course, any caller to this function would have to update itself. But that's something we already have to do anyways, right? Because that's something that our code, we want it to compile in that kernel, so we would have to change it anyways. So in some sense, there's a little bit of extra work in here, but some of that work you have to do anyways because you have to fix your driver code. So this can help make you find it easier. The really cool thing is because we're tracking FreeBSD head, somebody commits a change to an IF structure function, and we find out immediately instead of finding out when we test our driver on the new kernel, which doesn't happen as often. So this is a great way. It actually can accelerate keeping up to date, and then we can keep our compatibility code knowing about those changes and handling it. So, this match is totally um, so yeah, it, we basically, the kernel header gets changed, then the next night we have a script that runs that, that takes our TDE code, strips out the changes we had to make, if any, compares them, gets a diff, and applies it. If it works, if patch applies cleanly, then it submits that patch automatically, and then we can, we can review it, has to pass all of our tests, and then once it does pass, we can commit it. That part's automatic. If, for example, uh, you have a case where the code, we have to change it, uh, let me find an example of that. Uh, we have this guy here, like if something happened where somebody changed, say, this line of code, right? Um, if somebody were to go in and like change this particular line of code in the header file, it would likely cause the patch tool to conflict because the context doesn't match. In that case, we get an email and some developer, me or Eric, or somebody would have to come along and then manually fix that patch and get it applied and get it working. So that happens, but that's only happened a few times for us. And I expect it will happen more as the thing goes on because eventually some of this code, someone's gonna refactor it and change how it works. Uh, but the idea is most of the time it's automatic and we try to limit like using these for cases that really make sense. Uh, so we, it's specifically, we have to fix C++ breakages like class or new. Um, in some cases, we had to fix like constant pointers because the TDD tests complain about the things that were specified as const when they shouldn't be or not specified as const when they should. Um, and in many cases, we've actually taken those changes and submitted patches to the upstream to fix that bug so we wouldn't have to do that in the future. Um, but in the case like here, we don't remove this because the basically the problem is calling the actual macro PCI name bus master, it's K object function, and our test framework doesn't set up that K object, so this would do nothing. And we opted instead of trying to figure out how to make the test do all of the K object setup to just replace these all with mocks, which is a trade-off. Uh, so yeah, hopefully it's not too much work. I found it so far, I've had to do maybe a dozen fixes the last year since we started automating it. Um, and so I, the, the return is low. And hopefully the, the goal will be if we can get approval to publish the common infrastructure, then people can pull that as a dependency and we would be keeping it up to date for our purposes or people could help update it if they see it's not working. So, uh, but at the moment we're, we're in the process of doing that. It's gonna take a lot, so. Yep. Any other questions? Yeah.
Thank you for listening.